I'm pleased to open the second session of this uh, of this conference. We're going to have th three speakers. The first is uh, Farmer Levy, former head of the Mossad, a national security advisor to the Prime Minister of Israel during the war, the Yom Kippur War. Uh, Ephraim was head of the Mossad, uh, chief of the Mossad in Washington. Second speaker will be Professor Ita Itamar Rabinovich, who was a former Israel ambassador to the United States and fo former president of Tel Aviv University, and has uh, published extensively on Middle East affairs. And the third one, which we expect to come, is uh, Dan Shapiro, U.S. ambassador to Israel. We'll begin with Ephraim. Please, Ephraim. Well, at least I know who I am now. <laughs> uh, ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for inviting me here to this uh, event. Uh, since time is uh, short and the um, audience uh, doesn't only want to hear me, it also wants to get back home in a timely fashion, um, I'd like to uh, preface my remarks by simply saying a few words about uh, the roles I played in this uh, drama. Um, I took over... Um, it took charge of the relationship, the intelligence relationship between Israel and the United States uh, three weeks before the Six-Day War in 1967 in Israel. And in 1970, I came to Washington as a station chief for North America with, of course, uh, emphasis on Washington. And I served under the late uh, ambassadors uh, Rabin and Dinitz. Um, my role was manifold. A, I had to uh, handle the relationship, the uh, daily relationship between the agencies. And I also had to take care of the special channel which was uh, created, which was mentioned here this evening, between the President and the White House and uh, the Prime Minister of Israel, Mrs. Meir. And all the messages to and fro passed through me. And uh, I was the only one in the embassy except for the uh, ambassador and the deputy ambassador who uh, were authorized to read them. And um, I was uh, convinced that since this was a Mossad channel, that my chief, the head of the Mossad, uh, was reading these messages. And I used to write him weekly letters. And I used to uh, survey the situation in Washington. I used to re refer very often to these uh, messages and to what was said in it. And I never got any response from my chief, the head of the Mossad. I sent him letters. I never got them back till this day. And only last year did I realize and I found out that he didn't even read the messages which were sent on the secret channel. So he didn't know what was happening, and I did. So um, that is something which is also maybe uh, um, a strange uh, revelation in its, uh, in its own fashion. Um, but I did read the messages, and uh, especially Ambassador Rabin used to very often to uh, ask me to go over them before they were sent, and to make uh, if there was any correction in style or so forth, and we used to discuss it at length sometimes. He used to write most of the messages at night. He used to call me at one o'clock in the morning, ask if I'm still awake, and then uh, called me over to the residence, and we went over them. But I would like... Uh, to say something about the period of 1967-1970, and I think uh, Ambassador Kurtz will refer to this, but I'd like to say something more um, detailed in terms of the background. The period of 1967-1970 after the Six-Day War was a period in the United States-Israel uh, relations, not only when these relations matured, as uh, Ambassador Kurtz has said, but also a period in which Israel was a student in international affairs a student in interpower relationships. And uh, over those three years, uh, which were also the years of uh, from 1967 to 70, were the years in which I think um, much of the strategy of Israel and the understanding of Israel of itself and of the relationship with the United States became clear. This was the period I'd like to remind you, not only of the war of attrition, the Thousand Day War, it was also a period in which um, Egypt's skies uh, 
originally after the Six-Day War were uh, bare and open to uh, Israeli aircraft. And in order to protect Egypt, four um, squadrons of aircraft were sent to Egypt to protect their skies. Two Russian squadrons, Soviet squadrons, which patrolled the northern part of uh, the Egyptian skies, and North Korean aircraft. Two squadrons of North Korean aircraft who patrolled the skies of southern Egypt, which in itself presented a very difficult uh, intelligence channel to Israel because we couldn't rely on our, the uh, Jewish uh, community in Pyongyang to get uh, uh, <coughs> people who understood the language. And it was very difficult, extremely difficult, to follow the chatter of, uh, of, of uh, North uh, Korean uh, pilots. And one of the uh, tasks at that time was to try and get a, a group of people here who could do it. And um, uh, I think it's not too revelatory to say that the United States was helpful in that uh, because they did understand Korean, because they were in the Korean War of the 50s and we were not there, thankfully. But this is also the period in which Israel fashioned its relationship um, with the Soviet Union in a different way than it was before. We were not only the recipients of uh, the um, might of the Soviet Union in terms of the weak equipment which they supplied to our enemies, to the Egyptians and to the Syrians and to others, but also as a period in which we fashioned our understanding of the Russians and how they operated. And um, this was the period in which, as the war of attrition uh, day in, day out was fought, um, the Russians uh, upped the ante and um, provided ever more sophisticated equipment to the, uh, their own forces there and to the Egyptian uh, air, air force, which was being uh, um, restored gradually. And as the Egyptians were receiving and the Russians were operating with more and more sophisticated aircraft, we had to have more and more sophisticated uh, uh, weaponry in very, very sophisticated areas. And that was where also the uh, relationship between Israel and uh, the United States was uh, key. Um, I think the, um, the um, I'd say the, um, the height of all these uh, events was an event which took place in uh, 1970, when um, the, Mrs. Meir and the uh, Minister of Defense took the decision to uh, ensnare the uh, Russian uh, Air Force uh, squadrons in Egypt. And in a, uh, an exercise which was carried out, uh, four um, Russian uh, MiG aircraft were ensnared and enticed into uh, Israeli uh, airspace and were then uh, chased and shot down and we destroyed four Russian aircraft. In other words, Israel faced up to the Soviet Union directly. And the question was, what would happen? And ultimately what happened was that the Russian Air, uh, air Force left Egypt. And this was one of the turning points in terms of the psychology of not only the intelligence uh, uh, community in Israel, but of the establishment, the defense establishment as a whole. Israel, as the French said, it arrived, it arrived. We arrived to the top. And we respected the uh, might of the, uh, of, of the IDF was respected, not only in terms of what it had achieved in the Six-Day War, which could have been uh, considered as a uh, uh, a passing miracle, uh, which doesn't always happen, but we were now sort of established, as it were, as the fighting force, as a major force in the region. But also intelligence-wise, we developed in those years capabilities which were second to none. And we had information which was second to none. And in the years from 1968, I'd say, till 1973, the quality of information which we were able to provide, if we decided to provide it, was superior in every aspect. And we were certain, beyond any shadow of a doubt, that we knew everything that was worth knowing about our enemies. And we had good reason to think so. Not because of one specific source or another specific source, but the entirety, the entirety of the sourcing was such that we really knew we were on top of it. And the United States came to respect the Israeli intelligence community as knowing 
and they turn to the intelligence community time and time again for their comments, for our comments. And to a large extent, I don't say relies exclusively on us, that would be uh, too much to say, but certainly valued our evaluation of information and so forth beyond any other service, I think, in the world. It must also be understood then that at that time, there were frequent visits of the Prime Minister and uh, the Minister of Defense to the United States, and they met with the, uh, the um, highest levels there in Washington. I used to accompany the, uh, the Minister of Defense to meetings he had with the uh, um, directors of the CIA. And from time to time, uh, the directors of the CIA not only discussed intelligence, they also asked about Israel's capabilities in general vis-a-vis -vis Russian equipment like the SA-6 or the SA-3 or things like that, or the evaluation. And Mr. Dayan always said that there are, no, uh, there are no match to the Israeli Defense Forces and we can take care of them uh, in no time. Not to worry at all. There was no reason to worry. We had it, we were on top of it. Um, one of the turning points was, I think, towards the end of 1971. Uh, the meeting of 1971 was mentioned here. Uh, I think by uh, Dr. Kipnis, a meeting between Mrs. Meir and uh, the President. But here I'll just give a snippet. I don't want to go into all the things he said. I don't have the time to do it, and I didn't have the capacity to go into all the things which were in his book. But the meeting of 1971 was not only in the backdrop of what was happening in general, it was also on the backdrop of information which was solid, that in the most recent meetings that had taken place between President Sadat and the Russian leadership, Sadat had demanded to receive uh, air bombers, bomber fighters that could affect deep pen penetration into Israeli airspace. And the argumentation he used was that without having this capability, Egypt could not go to war. This was essential. And the Russians turned him down. This was high quality information. This was not just uh, something, uh, uh, one little piece, uh, snippet of information or so on. This was high quality information from more than one source. A, it showed that we knew what was going on. B, we could prove that what we knew was true. And B, we, and C, if you like, we could convince the United States and the United States leadership, and I think we did convince the United States leadership, that we had the cap capability to do what was necessary, and there was no reason to fear on that. And therefore, that basically the Arab the armies and the Arab air forces did not have the capability they thought they needed in order to conduct a war. Um, on the um, second day of Rosh Hashanah of that year, Tzvi um, Rachfiach, uh, who was then uh, in the embassy in Washington, uh, had a party at his home. And he was... Uh, host to the, all the embassy at the time. And I got a call there, an urgent call to uh, come to a meeting uh, with my uh, CIA counterpart. This was most unusual. A, I like to remember, recall and remind you at the time there were no um, cellular phones existing at the that time. And therefore I had to leave all kinds of uh, uh, contact uh, numbers from time to time at a, uh, at a switchboard. And suddenly I got this, uh, this uh, request to come right away on the second day of Rosh Hashanah, on the uh, final hours of Rosh Hashanah, to, for a meeting. And I was given a, a document, which was a document which described the movements and plans of the Syrian army, the way it had been received from an excellent source in the, by the United States. And I came back to, uh, to that apartment and I immediately called uh, the military attaché, General Gur of blessed memory, who went on to become chief of staff, as you remember. He was then uh, the military attaché in Washington. And I showed him the paper and he went over it and said, don't worry, Ephraim, it is an exercise. It's not serious. But send it back and see what they say. And I sent it back within hours. I got a reply saying it is an exercise. 
And in the days to come, between Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur, almost every day, we were asked, is there anything new, is there anything happening, and so on and so forth. It's an exercise. And when the Yom Kippur war broke out, um, for the first couple of days, the embassy in Washington knew really nothing about what was going on. There was a, almost a complete blackout as to what was going on. And then on the third day of the war, uh, things became apparent. And um, we were trying to get some kind of uh, indication uh, from back home as to what the situation was. And I was called in to a senior meeting uh, from our counterparts. And the tone was totally different than the tone which I had experienced throughout the years I had spent in Washington to that moment. And I was told, I was given a list of requirements concerning intelligence and other capabilities we might have, and questions concerning the exact situation of what was actually going on. And I was told that if I didn't succeed in getting the information to the end of business of that day, uh, the relationship between the agencies would be suspended. Well, it wasn't suspended, and um, we did what we did, and I don't want to go into the, the details, but the tone was such. And I think that after the third day of the war, the um, realization in Washington was that there was not a clear picture of what was going on. And there was not a clear picture as to what Israel's capabilities were. And the image which we had over the years, which I described in a few, de a few uh, small details, uh, of almost invincibility, uh, was shattered. And as uh, I think it was Mr. Professor Kwan said, um, when we came back, and I'll say we came back, with a picture and so forth, um, it wasn't clear with, to our counterparts whether what we were saying was the exact state of affairs as we really saw it. And as a result of that, um, we received a demand, um, and General Gore got a similar demand, that uh, we provide the United States, with a detailed order of battle of the entire um, Israeli army and its entire capability, and that we provide a clear um, description of uh, the positions we had and where we were and what was the state of the battle and so on and so forth. And this was something we had never been requested before. But this came also on the, uh, the background of something else which happened uh, in that third day, and that was a, um, a request by the Prime Minister to make a secret visit to Washington to meet with the President of the United States. And the response of the United States that this, uh, such a visit was not desirable for two reasons. A, because uh, it would be a, if it leaked, would be a symbol of the way Israel uh, felt and the way it, uh, achieved, uh, the way it uh, saw itself. The way the other side had damaged us in our own eyes. And B, uh, it would uh, not be appropriate from the point of view of the United States interests that this such a visit could take place and the visit did not take place. But the fact that the visit was requested was also an indicator of the seriousness of the situation. So um, a decision was made in Israel and um, an officer was appointed especially to take care of preparing this report for uh, the consumption of a very, very select uh, audience in the United States. And the officer was uh, Colonel Yuval Neeman, uh, 
who later became, I believe, a president of the, Hebrew, of the, I almost said Hebrew University, I apologize, of Tel Aviv University, and a, uh, a renowned intelligence officer as well. He served in intelligence for many years, and he was deputy head of uh, military intelligence for, many, for a period of time as well. And he created the picture. And we were instructed, uh, General Gore and I, to meet with the Secretary of Defense, who was then uh, James Schlesinger, and the Director of the CIA, who was William Colby, and to present this report to them personally. And this we did. And we came to the meeting in the Pentagon, and uh, we found in the ante room uh, another gentleman waiting to enter, and that was the uh, Chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, uh, Admiral Moore. And uh, he had been invited to the meeting. And um, General Gore said that we are under instructions that you could only go to these two gentlemen, the Secretary of Defense and the Director of the CIA. And the result was that um, uh, Admiral Moore uh, did not attend the meeting. And I don't think he, um, he looked upon it uh, lightly and uh, in a friendly manner afterwards. I cannot uh, give you some... Uh, uh, I cannot give you some, uh, any, uh, any indication as to um, what they did with the, with the report they got, because I don't know what they could have done by themselves reading this piece of paper, but at any rate, that's what happened. I will now, now jump to three other uh, uh, events which took place during the war. And as I said, I've just been given uh, five minutes, so I'll try and be as uh, circumspect as possible. The first was on the 12th of October. Um, we, have, we had a somewhat different uh, perception on this issue, which was mentioned before, of a ceasefire uh, in situ, as it was called, on the spot. The way we understood it in the embassy was that we had come along and said that we, the General Dayan, the uh, Minister of Defense, said that he thought maybe it was a good idea to have a ceasefire in place. And the response we got from the Secretary of State was, that we should on no circumstance agree to this because this would be tantamount to accepting defeat. We should not accept a ceasefire in place. That's number one. Um, I've gone through my records before I came here and that's the way I had it, but um, it's somewhat different to the way you understood it. But that's what happens when you have a, a great power and a slightly smaller power and uh, they um, uh, communicate. The second was the second point was um, as we uh, came towards the end of the war. I'd like to mention by the war that in the first week or week and a half of the war, Israel lost 80 aircraft and 800 tanks. A third of the um, I think of the air force went in that period of time and uh, a very large number of tanks, 800 tanks, who were knocked out of uh, action. Regardless of the human uh, um, toll of, uh, of uh, fatalities and casualties. Um, the second event I'd like to recall was, uh, to recall is the, um, the encirclement of the Third Army. In the end, we achieved the encirclement of the Third Army. And the Third Army was uh, struggling for food and water. And we did not allow food and water to get in. We demanded that there should be direct contact between us and the Egyptians, which ultimately became 101. And as the situation became more and more serious and the Russians uh, threatened to uh, intervene, and I don't want to go into all the uh, litany that uh, was uh, mentioned before. I don't want to uh, go into the details. Um, but we were, there was information that there were three uh, airborne divisions uh, uh, readied by the uh, Russians to intervene. And we were told by the United States uh, at a certain point in time that if Israel did not allow food and water to enter, um, the relationship between Israel and the United States would uh, be seriously uh, impaired. And I'm using a very light phrase. And I can say that uh, I know for a fact that Mrs. Uh, Meir, at that moment in time, 
uh, contemplated also uh, a possible resignation of office, which did not materialize because ultimately the Egyptians did agree to direct contact and the problem was uh, relieved. And the last event which was mentioned here was the alert, the nuclear alert, which of course was very serious and there was also information that a, uh, a Soviet um, a sea craft had uh, passed through the Bosphorus emanating, emanating uh, uh, signals of uh, nuclear capability and um, we were told this and uh, this was considered a, a serious matter which we were told as a factor we should take into, into account in the last days on the last hours of the war and I was entrusted with the with the uh, task of finding out whether this was an alert based on real information or it was an alert which had a, um, shall we say, a, a persuasive context. And um, without revealing sources and methods these days, I think we should also be circumspect. I could come back in the end and say to my uh, masters that in my understanding, the way I understood what I was being told, it was not on the basis of information. And there was really no information, solid information, on, on a Russian a nuclear um, uh, presence which was moving towards Egypt. And this uh, certainly uh, influenced uh, the decision making in Israel. Um, two last sentences. Um, you mentioned the catbird seat, I think. It's very clear that the United States thought, as of 1973-74, that there was only one moderator of the events in the Middle East, and the Russians were out. Uh, the Russians did not have a presence in Israel. They didn't have an embassy in Israel. They had cut off relations in 67. In 72, they established a secret uh, channel with us. And I was, uh, when I got back home, I was in charge of that channel for several uh, years. And in 1975, uh, we had a so-called secret visit of two Russian uh, envoys who came. One of them uh, was um, Mr. Primakov, who uh, billed himself as a uh, senior uh, journalist. But he, we knew he was a KGB officer, and in the end he became head of the KG, uh, SVR, the KGB, and prime minister of uh, Russia and foreign minister. But that time, he billed himself in that day. He came as, a, as, a, um, as a, an envoy to uh, meet the leadership in Israel. And he met the Prime Minister, who was then Yitzhak Rabin, the Minister of Defense, who was then Shimon Peres, and the uh, Foreign Minister, who was then Yigal Alon. And there was one message he had to tell them, that was all. And that is, you should not think that you, will be, you and the United States will be able to remove the R Russia and the Soviet Union from the Middle East. You cannot expel us from the Middle East. And at one occasion when I attended these meetings and uh, took the notes of those meetings and traveled back with him from Tel, with Tel Aviv, our car went out of action and uh, we got out and we were standing next to the bonnet and uh, Kremlikov got very, very excited and he banged his hand on the bonnet and uh, unfortunately uh, uh, he bruised his hand and they had uh, blood running from it. And he said to me, you see this red blood running from it? You will not be able to remove us from the Middle East. Thank you. <laughs>